Haul the roll and go. Where am I to go, me Johnny? Where am I to go? For I'm a young and a sailor lad, and where am I to go? Hello, and welcome to Where Am I To Go podcast. Today we are at a museum that has always been on my top 10 <laughs> as far as museums go. I visited here twice, one time at their old location and now at their new location. We are in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and we are at the National Museum of Nuclear Science and History. And I'm here with Sam today. <laughs> wow, almost forgot his name. <laughs> Anyway, we're here with Sam, and Sam's going to talk to us about uh, this museum. And just as a he heads up, I really like this museum, and the reason I do is because nuclear energy, nuclear weapons, nuclear everything is such a controversial subject, and this museum does a very nice job of presenting both sides and of giving an overview of, of nuclear history in such a way that it's easy to understand and very non-biased, uh, I guess I would say. It, they, try to, they try to be non-biased. Some of us have a little bit of bias. Well, but it's, it's a controversial subject, so of course you're going to. But this, and this may get controversial. Who knows? I don't really care. Okay. Uh, I want history and I want to know how everything went. So uh, welcome, Sam, to Where Am I To Go podcast. Thank you. Okay. I wanted to give you a quick background so you know where I'm coming from. Just go ahead. Let's do your background so you know where we're coming from. Oh, okay. You, you, <laughs> I, I want it. Oh, okay. So, I, okay, I will give you a quick background. Graduated from the Air Force Academy in 1964. Okay. Went to pilot training, went into strategic air command as a B-52 pilot. Have uh, many hours on alert as a B-52 pilot with nuclear weapons, both co-pilot and pilot. Spent a year in Vietnam as a forward air controller. And then uh, came back, checked out as an aircraft commander and flew Arclight in, B in B-52s in Vietnam. So I'm familiar with the alert during the Cold War era. Okay. And then I was assigned for a master's degree in chemistry, taught at the Air Force Academy for four years, went back to bombers and wing staff for four years, and then went to the Air Power Research Institute as the original strategic research associate, and then took command of the Defense Nuclear Agency Detachment at Los Alamos National Laboratory for two years. Okay. And from there, I went six years to the Lockheed Skunk Works. And then when the F-22 went to Marietta, Georgia, I went down there on a different program. Okay, so you haven't been involved in nuclear your whole life at all, have you? No, no. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is an honor to do a tour with somebody that's so knowledgeable and, and uh, has such a, a wide range of, of knowledge. Now, when you were flying the B-52s, were you carrying nuclear weapons in uh, those planes? or uh, I flew one airborne alert armed. Uh, I was a brand new co-pilot. They needed somebody as an extra pilot to fill the right seat when the pilot was resting, so that was me. Okay. But after that, I went, uh, I went to Vietnam before our next rotation in the unit for airborne alert, and when I got back, they were no longer flying armed. Okay. So that was after the uh, 68 incident at Thule. Okay, what was the 68 incident at Thule? Well, the, there was a mission at Thule. One of the airborne alert orbits was a figure eight over Thule, Greenland at the ballistic missile early warning site. Okay. So we were radio relay in case they lost, radio, lost communication with the lower 48. Our aircraft had the capability of talking to them on UHF and then talking to all three numbered Air Force headquarters and SAC headquarters in the States via HF radio. Okay. So we were a radio relay if needed. We were one of the five orbits. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, right here is where we start with what they call pathway to discovery. Okay. The splitting of the atom was not a sudden thing. It actually began back in the mid 1800s. Really? Yeah. With John Dalton is the is generally considered to be the individual that conceptualized the atom as we know it today. Okay. But in 
600 BC, there was an Indian philosopher who came up with the idea. And in 460 BC, Democritus in Greece came up with the idea. So it's not new, but they had, wow. they had no science to back it. Dalton is where the science starts to back up the atom to describe it as we know it today. Really? Yeah. I have, didn't have any idea that they were aware of the atom that long ago. Well, it was a philosophical concept that there was a basic piece of matter. Okay. And so now Mendeleev takes that knowledge and creates the first periodic chart based on atomic weight. That's not the exactly correct way to do it, but it was good enough that they were actually able to predict where elements should be and then find them. Okay, and as we come into the museum, you have the periodic table all laid out in tile on the floor. Yeah. It's kind of cool. Yeah, the, uh, that is actually very handy, especially when we're working with students. Okay, yeah, I'll bet it is. Yeah, so various people contribute. You have Marie Curie working with radium. Albert Einstein, I don't even need to say anything right. about. Uh, Koch and Rentgen, Rentgen the X-ray, Thompson the discovered the electron. Rutherford put together the concept of the nucleus of the atom with protons and neutrons, and then Neil Bohr put the electrons around them. Okay. So now you had a concept of the atom. Then in 1938, Otto Hahn and, and Fritz Strassmann were working in Germany, and in December they of 38, they split the atom. And they didn't know what they'd done. Okay. They had a colleague, Elisa Mittner, who was Jewish. And when Hitler took over Austria in 1938, she had to flee to Sweden. Okay. So they sent the data to her. And she and her nephew, Otto Hahn, went on a long walk and they figured out what had happened. And in fact, Otto Hahn named it fission after cell division. Really? Okay. So now, Otto Fresh and Niels Bohr are good friends. So he tells Niels Bohr about it. About halfway through the explanation, the light dawns on Niels Bohr. Niels Bohr then, in 1939, attends a physics conference in the U.S., and at that point, the world knew the atom had been split. Okay, so the Germans are the ones that first split the atom. Yeah. And they were the for forefront on, on the knowledge, or...? Uh, Yes and no. Okay. Uh, one of their big problems was that they, Hitler, in his anti-Jewish rants, had chased almost every nuclear scientist out of Germany, Hungary, and all the surrounding areas. The, and so actually in Germany, the one who really understood it that was left was Heisenberg. Okay. And... Um, Hitler didn't even want nuclear physics taught in the universities. Heisenberg defied him and taught it. Really? Yeah. So what, what you actually have is that all the German scientists that would have been integral in his program were working for the United States and Great Britain. Okay. So. Wow. That's, that's interesting. Now, for the, you, uh, some people have heard of the Einstein letter. And that is a letter signed by Albert Einstein that went to Roosevelt that started our nuclear program. Okay. Now, the Einstein letter was not written by Einstein. It was written, written by Leo Szilard, a Hungarian Jewish scientist. Okay. And he was very politically astute. And when he saw Germany trying to gather uranium and heavy water, he knew where they were going. So he wrote the letter, got Einstein to sign it, because Einstein was the only scientist with enough horsepower to get it to Roosevelt. Right. Roosevelt read it and reacted and established a committee to look at it under Lehman Briggs, the uh, chief of the National Bureau of Standards. Now, during that time period, they held a meeting, the military, everybody involved, and they came up with four goals. Find a source of uranium, find a commercial method to purify it, See if it could be used for energy. See if it could be used for a weapon. Okay. And that's about as far as it went until about the middle of 1941. Because Lehman Briggs was not the least bit interested. Huh. In 1940, uh, Rudolf Perls and Otto Fresh had done a series of calculations and come up with a concept 
that you'd only need about a pound of enriched uranium to make a weapon. Before that, everybody was thinking of shiploads of uranium, maybe get it into a port and explode it. Wow. So that was a major breakthrough. And they sent their letter to the British and to America. Lehman Briggs dropped it in his file, forgot about it. The British jumped on it immediately and initiated their MOD project, making tube alloys, which was their code word for nuclear science. Okay, so now was that part of the Lend-Lease program? Or? No, that was, they, they were working on it on their own. Okay. U.S., Great Britain, Germany, and Japan were all running independent programs. So Japan was running it too? Yeah. Now, as it turns out, uh, the peop some people around here are more knowledgeable in this than I am, obviously, but uh, several of us believe that Japan may have been a bit further along than Germany, because in Germany, Hitler considered it Jewish science. Right. He didn't want to play any part of it. It wasn't fast enough for him. And the army was jealous of the academics, so what little resource they had was split between two people. Two okay, groups. Right. So with that kind of split resource, there was no way. Huh. Japan was under resource, but at least it was under the direction of a single director. Okay. So how much did we beat Japan by as far as oh, the significant, development? Oh, significant. Okay, okay. Significant. They, neither Germany nor Japan ever put enough resources into it to get anywhere where they could get a viable weapon. Okay. And... Uh, a little further on, we can discuss exactly what kind of resources we put into it. It's mind-boggling. Okay. That'd be great. Then we come on into this, uh, this gallery here. We have a lot of uh, World War II, World War II, I'm assuming. Yes. Uh, weaponry, sword, helmet. Uh, That's a, an aircraft radio. An aircraft radio. Okay. And then here you have the German. And just note of interest, look at the... Japanese rifle and the German rifle, and notice how small they are as compared to the M1 Garand, which was the standard World War II rifle. Right, but the M1 Garand was semi-auto, and these, these are ones all bolt. are bolt. Yeah. Right. Yeah. The M1 Garand is heavy. Yes, it is a heavy. I, I've, I've shot one before, and they yeah, are Yeah, well, I lived with one for three years at the Academy. <laughs> I didn't do that, but I'd sure like to have one now. <laughs> They are a lot of fun. <laughs> uh, this next display, and unfortunately your, your listeners can't see it, but it is a, a display involving a lot of original radio type equipment, uh, scientific equipment that's all tubes and, right. and everything. Now, now they could do this with a, with a cell phone. But. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, well, no, they could do twice, three times as much <laughs> right. with a cell phone. But at any rate, this is a science... Uh, an artist concept of the four different laboratories working on critical mass. Okay. And what's interesting about it is everything there is period correct, but on top of that, everything there came from Los Alamos. So oh, in, okay. So in concept, that actually could have been in these labs. Okay. And we're looking at a, at a display that's probably 15 by 15 that has computers or not, not computers, but tube-operated mm -hmm. radio mm -hmm. equipment and stuff that's standing eight foot tall. We've got uh, about 10 boxes that are two foot wide, two foot deep, and eight foot tall with wires coming out of them. We've got typewriters, we've got adding machines, we've got all kinds of things in this display. And uh, what, are the, what are the bricks around... Uh, uh, on, sitting on top of a table with a big bowl those are, with those a little are lead, cylinder in it. Those are lead bricks to protect against neutron radioactivity. Okay. The, the cylinders are how they were determined, they're trying to determine critical mass. Okay. So uh, they would bring the two halves of the cylinder together and see, and they would hear it pick up on the Geiger counter and they'd move it apart and they'd know when you know, they do oh, okay. get readings out of it. Now, there were two accidents. One, where they were bringing it together, and they had a screwdriver in there, and it slipped, and it came together, and it flashed. And the individual that was doing the experiment told everybody to freeze, drew circles around, had told them to draw circles around where they were. He knew he had a lethal dose. 
but everybody else, because they knew where each person was, they were able to tailor medical help for them, and he was the only one that died. Really? Yeah. But he saved everybody else in He's, the process? Yes. Wow. The, the second accident occurred on something that was totally bizarre. The scientist was working on it, and he leaned over his experiment, and his body became a neutron reflector and reflected neutrons back in and caused it to flash. Really? Wow. <laughs> <laughs> you wouldn't have thought your body would be able to do that. No, it, it's surprising, but yeah, you'd be surprised what will reflect the neutron. <laughs> Well, and, and being new into the technology and stuff, you don't understand that yeah, stuff that's until exactly, what happens. That's exactly the point. That's why they were trying to figure critical mass. Now, I don't know if everybody understands critical mass. Why don't you tell me? Because I don't know if I understand critical okay, mass. Okay, so there are three terms I'm going to be using with respect to critical mass that are important. Subcritical. That means that, yes, it's radioactive. It is not enough to sustain a chain reaction. Okay. Critical mass is enough radioactive material to sustain a chain reaction. Okay. Supercritical mass is an explosive mass. Okay. So when you're dealing with it, you're taking subcritical mass, putting it into a reactor, bringing it critical, and holding it at a certain level. That's a nuclear reactor. Okay. If you just let it go, it goes supercritical. That's a bomb. That's a bomb. Okay. And now what you're using for this critical mass, I'm assuming mass refers to a weight of some sort or another. Is that the weight of the plutonium or? Uh, yeah, it, it kind of transfers to weight, um, but it's either plutonium or uranium-235 enriched. Okay. So that, that's the, that, the two primary sources of fission are U-235 enriched. Uh, reactors take 5 to 10 percent enrichment. Uh, weapons take an incredible amount of enrichment. Okay, and what are they enriching it with? Well, we'll get to that. Okay, okay. Because, yeah, okay. Because I know that, that they mine uranium and plutonium both right out of the ground. They do not mine plutonium. Plutonium is man-made. Oh, okay, okay. Well, I know uh, that they do uranium. Yeah, cause... as a matter of fact, uranium, atomic number 92, is the last naturally occurring element in the periodic chart. Okay. Periodic chart now goes to 118. Okay. Everything above that's man-made. Okay. Plutonium is made is a byproduct of a nuclear reactor. Okay. They call them breeder reactors. Okay. So, where, where do we go from here? Well, once the United States got off its butt and they uh, formed uh, the... Uh, Van Everbush took over the committee from Lehman Briggs, and he realized things that needed to move on, so he said the weaponry needs to go to the military. So the military formed, the engineer, formed an engineering district through the Corps of Engineers to deal with it. And in true Corps of Engineer tradition, the group was formed in Manhattan, ergo it was the Manhattan Engineering District. Okay. So that's where the Manhattan Project came from. Okay. So at that point, it was under the command of Colonel uh, George Marshall, and uh, Lehman Briggs felt it was not moving fast enough, so he pulled him out and put Leslie Groves in. Groves had brought the Pentagon in on, on time, on budget, and Groves really didn't want it. He wanted to go overseas because he wanted to be a general, and they told him he would make general if he took it. He took it September 12th, September 23rd. He was promoted to general. Wow. So, that, so that's where that went. Now, in 41 to 42, they were still doing basic science okay. around it. In, in 42, Enrico Fermi was charged with seeing if he could make a sustained chain reaction. And what he, he was working at the University of Chicago, and the University of Chicago football stadium had been abandoned for about five years, and there was a soccer court, okay. or a, a squash court, under the stadium. And so that's where he was working. And he built what's called Chicago Pile One. Okay. And on December, I believe it's 2nd or 3rd, 
of 19, December 2nd, 1942, he said, we're going to break for lunch and we're going to start it after lunch. They broke for lunch, they came back, they started it, and he was exactly right. They had a sustained chain reaction. Okay, and what, is, what exactly does that mean? Well, that means a number of things. Number one, that's your first nuclear reactor. Okay. So, that, so they were getting energy from that. They were getting energy. They were not using it yet, but yes, they were getting energy from it in the form of heat. Okay. And number two, it proved beyond a shadow of doubt that a nuclear weapon was feasible. Okay. Wow. So he was using uranium and blocks of uh, graphite. And the reason for that is when you split the atom, a, a neutron will split an atom of high atomic weight. Okay. And uh, Niels Bohr figured out that if you had a, an even number of protons and an odd number of neutrons, that gave you your best possibility of splitting. Okay. Ergo, uranium-235, plutonium-239. Okay. So it's 92, 235, 94, 239. Okay. So when you split the atom, you get two what they call daughter products or two fission products. It's two smaller atoms, basically. Okay. But in addition, you get anywhere from two to three neutrons. Okay. So the problem is those neutrons coming out are extremely energetic. They are coming out at 200 million electron volts. Okay. That's, that's a lot of power. That's a lot of power. But you really want this uh, neutron running about 2 million electron volts so that it'll interact with the nucleus. Okay. That's where the moderator comes in. So graphite or heavy water slows the neutron down without absorbing it. Okay. So you've slowed it down to the speed you want and then it can interact with other atoms. And so Chicago Pile 1 was a mix of uranium and graphite bricks. Okay, and so they sent the atom through the graphite bricks and it slowed it down before it hit the atom. Well, the, the neutron, it was started with a neutron generator. Okay. And then as the neutrons came off, they were slowed down so they'd interact with the rest of it. Okay. Dang. And he, you've got some pictures here of these neutron blocks, or I mean graphite bro blocks. Well, we actually have one of his blocks. Oh, do you? This is wow. A, this is a Lego model of Chicago Pile 1. The, the gray kind of represents uranium in the... Okay. There, that is actually one of his neutron uh, one of his uh, graphite blocks, and you can see its number in the position. Okay. And how long do these hold up to this uh, activity? Forever, basically. Forever. Okay. They, they just slow it down. They don't interact. They just slow it down. Okay, and this is kind of a Lego model of a reactor? Of, of what's called Chicago Pile 1. Okay, and it's built out of Legos, but it shows very well uh, how things are set up. And then you've got your gra graphite block, and the graphite block is, what, probably 4 inches by 4 inches and 14, 15 inches long? Something like Something that. Something like that. May maybe more. And that's solid graphite? Solid graphite. Solid graphite. Wow. Okay. <clears throat> so, in 1942, December, we know beyond a shadow of a doubt that an atomic bomb is possible. Okay. So now, we move full speed into the Manhattan Project. Okay. And Los Alamos was chosen for a number of reasons. They needed a place that was relatively isolated but not so far away from logistics that they couldn't get what they needed. Okay. They were looking for an isolated area. Turns out Robert Oppenheimer's family has a ranch in Chico Canyon. Okay. They are aware of the Los Alamos Ranch School, which in 1942 was told they were going out of business because Los, uh, Los Alamos was taking it over. Okay. And Los Alamos is kind of uh, north central, it's, no, kind of western central New Mexico, Yeah, right? it's, it's a little west of, if you go the road, uh, Albuquerque, Santa Fe, it's to the west, to up, the in west. The, up in the Jemez Mountains. And it's beautiful country around Oh, there. it is. It's gorgeous country. Now, some fun facts about Los Alamos. Um, the school had six primary houses for professors and stuff. 
And that picked up the name, nickname Bathtub Row because those were the only houses that had bathtubs. They were for the <laughs> chief scientists. Okay. And uh, the, they had figured they'd need about 600 people there. When they hit 6,000, they figured they'd made a mistake. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so wow. at any rate, from 1943, you had a, the Los Alamos Ranch School, which basically had the lodge and a few houses and you went to a city of about 6,000. Unbelievable. And what's interesting is you had a lot of young scientists who were married, newly married and stuff, and you had not that much to do. You know, they built their own ski area, they could hike, they could horseback ride, and General Gross had a heck of a time trying to figure out why he had to keep adding on to the maternity ward. <laughs> I wonder why. I wonder why. Yeah, we had a baby boom. <laughs> I'll bet you did. It turned from 6,000 to, to 7 and 8 pretty quick. Huh? And what's, what's even more interesting is one Sunday morning in here, I had a woman who said she was number 53 baby at Los Alamos. <laughs> wow. As it turns out, Los Alamos itself is the smallest part of the Manhattan Project. Okay. Uh, it's obviously the scientific hit. It's where everything came together. But there were two other major facilities that far outstripped Los Alamos. Was White Sands one of them? No. Okay. We're talking about Oak Ridge, and unfortunately it's kind of covered up here, but maybe we can sneak back. No, okay. Oak Ridge, Tennessee was tasked with two things. Number one, they were tasked to try to enrich uranium. Okay. And then number two, they were tasked to build a reactor and see if they could produce plutonium. Okay. They succeeded in building the reactor and producing plutonium. So that spun off the other site. But at Oak Ridge, they continued to work with uh, enriching uranium. And now what that means is natural uranium is 0.7% of your U-235 is 0.7% of natural uranium. Okay. So with U-235, you've got to get it to a very, very high concentration to make a bomb. Okay. 90% plus. So what they did was they tried three methods. The first one was thermal diffusion. And that sort of worked. And in fact, it kind of made feeder streams for the others. They tried gaseous diffusion. And while that didn't work during the war, they perfected it during the war, and it became the way of enriching uranium after the war. Okay. During the war, they used what was called a calutron, and it's a derivative of the cyclotron. So what they would do is they would take a uranium hexafluoride gas, ionize it, and accelerate it down a tunnel. At the end of the tunnel was an incredibly powerful electromagnet. Okay that would cause the stream to bend. Okay. And because you have a little wee tiny three atomic mass unit difference in weight, the U-238 will turn at a different rate than the U-235. So they would turn it and then they would bleed off the U-235 where it would, tur where it would hit in the turn. It, would, it was a 180 degree turn. So, then you would think, oh, they've got it. No, it would take tens of thousands of iterations on the same gas stream to get the uranium. <clears throat> this sounds complicated. It was. <laughs> <clears throat> and most of Oak, a lot of Oak Ridge was manned by young female high school graduates because all the males were gone. Right. Now, on, when they were doing this stream, the scientists were unhappy that they weren't getting, it, getting enough of yield on it, so they were going to show them how to do it. So they zeroed out the machines, and the scientists took over for a shift. They got butkus. Really? Nothing. So they sat down, shut up, and let the ladies do their work. <laughs> That's interesting. <laughs> now, <clears throat> but at any rate... To how, how dangerous was this, was this work that they were doing as far as health hazards and stuff uh, like that? Not too bad, because your uranium is what's called an alpha emitter. Okay. And an alpha particle, when it is emitted, 
will stop at your dead skin. So it's not going to penetrate. Okay. The only danger is, is if you inhale it, then it gets into your lungs. Okay. So they were pretty well protected. They knew that they knew the hazards as they were working with it, or, no, or no. people were dying and they were figuring out what the hazards were. Well, people weren't dying; they didn't have that problem. But basically, nobody knew what they were doing. Right. Th that was all part of the secrecy thing. But Oak Ridge, to give you an idea of the magnitude of that, was farmland in 1943. In 1945, it was a city of 75,000 people. Oh man, that's fast growing. That is a massive amount of engineering work. Now, uh, I mentioned earlier that the other thing they were to try to do was produce plutonium with Chicago Pile 2. Okay. And once they found out they could do that, <clears throat> they went to Hanford, Washington, along the Columbia River. Okay. And uh, in 1943, it was farmland. 1945, a city of somewhere between 50 and 60,000 people. And they had built Chicago Pile 3, 4, and 5. They had three reactors making plutonium. They had figured a way to separate it properly. And they were producing enough plutonium by the end of the war to make a bomb every maybe two to three weeks. Okay. And Hanford is still going, is that <coughs> Oh, correct? yeah. And, and they as got, is they've Oak got Ridge. one of the big nuclear waste sites there at Hanford, too. Correct? Yeah. And as is Oak Ridge. Oh, okay. They're both. Now, are they dumping nuclear waste at Oak Ridge also? They're not dumping nuclear waste there, but they're cleaning up at Hanford. Okay. It's cleanup. It's not dump. Oh, they're not. But they were dumping for years and years. Yeah, yeah. And and the nuclear plant there at Richland is it still? Going? That I'm not sure of. Okay, I just that I'm not sure of. But it, <clears throat> but at any rate, why did they choose those two locations? Well, first off. In Oak Ridge, you had the Tennessee Valley Authority, so you had water and power. Right. Oak Ridge is a bit away from Knoxville. Okay. But close enough that you can get to it. Hanford, along the Columbia River, you have the hydraulic power. Oh, yeah. And you, it, it's a bit away from everything, but you can get the logistics. Right. Okay. Well, they had a big they had a big military installation there also too. Uh, hmm. I think at Umatilla. Something I'm not or sure. Or someplace on. right in there. Yeah. Yeah, but the interesting thing about it is, by the end of the war, the Manhattan Project was using approximately 10 percent of all electrical power produced in the United States. 10 percent. Yes. Holy smokes! Now you see why they went to TVA in Columbia River. Right. The, electro, wow. the electromagnets they were using, they couldn't get copper because it was the wartime. Okay. Groves uh, 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 requisitioned, I don't know how many tons of silver from Fort Knox, and the electromagnets were built of silver wire. Wow. That's a lot of silver, too. Oh, yeah. And he returned all but a couple ounces of it. Really? So he did his job. Okay. Now... You've got, you've got Los Alamos, the scientific head, putting it together. You've got Oak Ridge making the uranium. And you've got Hanford making the plutonium. So you have all the things you need to put together for the ball. But they're not close together. They're, they're, they're separate. They're diversified deliberately. Right. Okay, okay. So they're moving, they're moving the uranium and the plutonium into Los Alamos. Okay. So now... The, the final component of being able to deliver the weapon is the 509th Composite Group under uh, Paul Tibbets, okay. Colonel Tibbets. He was charged with overseeing the modification of the B-29s so that they could carry the nuclear weapons. And they got the code name Silverplate. Okay. And he was in charge of recruiting all the crews, training all the crews, developing all the tactics, doing all the drop testing, and then deploying his unit, originally one to England, one to Europe, one to the Pacific, but the uh, European war ended first, but, so the whole unit went to the Pacific. So basically, there were 15 silver plate aircraft built. Okay. Enola Gay is one, and it's in the National Air and Space Museum, Chantilly, Virginia. Okay. The Udvahasi Complex. You have Boxcar which is in the National Museum of the United States Air Force in Dayton, Ohio. Okay. 
And then there is still one more in existence, and that's outside. Right out here? Yeah, we have the, we have ah. the last silver plate. Okay. Now, another interesting story with that. When Tibbetts had dropped the two bombs, LeMay asked him if he had any more of those. And he said, yeah, I've got one more. And LeMay said, get it over here, not realizing that it was up to Truman to t determine whether or not it could be released. Right. And the aircraft we have outside was delivered August 9th, 1945. Okay. After the second bomb. But if they'd have had to take the third bomb over, they would have taken a case. And we have a device over here that's mocked up to look like the gadget, which was the test device. Okay. And it's got a lot of extra wiring on it because if it didn't work, they wanted to know why. Okay. But that actually is War Reserve 4. That would have been the weapon. That one right there. That would have been the weapon. They put in the case, loaded on that airplane, and flowed the titty in. Wow. Okay, now <clears throat> you've, got, you've got a display case here with two models of uh, boxcar and, and uh, Enola Gay. Enola Gay is the one that did drop the, the bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. No, it dropped Hiroshima. It dropped Hiroshima. Who dropped? Oh, boxcar? Boxcar dropped Nagasaki. Okay. Okay. And were they spaced? They were spaced apart a day? Three days. Three days. Okay. Yeah. And they flew out of Tinian? Yes. Uh, Tinian North. Which is an island in Micronesia. Yeah, it's um, north of Guam. Uh, it's the Marianas chain. It's right. Guam, Saipan, Tinian are the main ones. Right. And then, uh, okay, so, so we're skipping a little bit of an area here, and that is they, they were able to develop the bomb through the Manhattan Project and through bringing these uh, pieces together here at Los Alamos, but they did testing prior to, or they had no idea what they were doing when oh, they dropped these bombs? No, they knew. Okay, and so how, let, how much testing was done on these bombs before they... Okay, uh, one test called Trinity. Okay. That was uh, July 16th, 19th. And that took place at White Sands, right? That's at White Sands. Trinity okay. is on White Sands. Now, they had the gadget, they had the Nagasaki bomb, they had War Reserve 4, Okay. and they had Little Boy, which was a uranium bomb. They okay. did not test the uranium bomb. Number one, they were absolutely certain it was going to go. Okay. And number two, they only had enough uranium for one bomb. Okay. In all that area, all that time, they only had enough uranium for one bomb. Wow. So they were getting plutonium. So they tested the plutonium weapon because it was taking whole new concepts together. Uranium is, the little boy is what's called a gun-assembled weapon. You have half the critical mass in the tail, half the critical mass in the front end. At the designated altitude, 1,800 feet, a conventional explosive will fire the back half into the front half and hold it together long enough for it to go supercritical and detonate. Okay. And they got 15 kilotons out of it. Now, with plutonium, when they tried that, there was no way they could get a long enough run or get it fast enough to keep it from melting down when it got together. Okay. So they had to come up with a whole new way to do it. Okay. So what you do, what they did was, you saw them uh, in that artist display testing spheres. Right. So what they wound up doing was they took a sphere of plutonium, about the size of basketball, volleyball, you know, whatever in that range, and in that configuration, it was subcritical. Now, they put explosives all the way around it. Okay. And they detonated them in such a manner that you had an, a completely symmetrical collapse with almost instantaneous collapse that brought the sphere down to about the size of a tennis ball. It's <sighs> now supercritical. Oh, yeah. So now you've got this explosive lens holding it together long enough for it to detonate. Fat man. Okay. And that was 21 kilotons. Wow. Amazing. And you've got, you've got mock-ups of, uh, of the bombs? No, those are actual bombs. Those are actual bombs. Yeah, we, the, the only mock-up we have out there, out there is Minuteman 1. Okay. And it has to be a mock-up because we can't have an assembled missile due to the START treaty. But the warhead on top is real. The re-entry vehicle on top is real. Really? Yeah. 
Okay. So now we have what looks like a mock-up right. of the gadget, which was the test device they fired at Trinity. But actually, as I said, it's War Reserve 4, and we added the extra wires to show the sensor wiring that they had in addition to the detonation wiring. Okay, and this is this is more of a round uh, object. It's, has, it's spherical, basically. And it's spherical, and it's probably six foot in diameter, uh, more like, kind of like a ball with little portholes and, and wires and sensors and lots of other stuff to it. But it's a pretty good sized uh, weapon. Weapon, yeah. yeah. Now, and how much would something like that weigh? Uh, they were in the 10,000 pound range. Okay. Uh, little boy here, this is actually a little boy. They made a number of little boy and fat men after the war. Okay. Now you'll notice antennas on, four antennas around it. Right. Uh, those are radar altimeters. They wanted it to go off at 1800 feet. Okay. And the reason for that is to maximize the blast effect. Right, it's right. It's called an airburst. Now, the Japanese also had radar altimeters, so they wanted to be sure that it went off. So you see those little things we call fences sticking up on the back of the Right, mountain? right. In front of each one of those is a hole, and under each one of those is a barometric sensor set for 1,800 feet. Really? Okay. So there are not, about nine of those. So now you've got four radar altimeters and about nine barometric altimeters set to detonate this thing. It's going to go off at 1,800 feet. They aren't satisfied. <laughs> there are about five timers in the tail set for 43 seconds, which is time of fall from 30,000 to 40. Wow. To 1,800 feet. <laughs> Nobody knows what set it off. Something did. <laughs> right. I right. would, if I had to bet on it, I'd bet on a radar altimeter or a uh, timer that's going a little fast because as rapidly as that's falling, those, that, those parametric sensors are going to lag a little bit. Okay, and now Little Boy looks more like a, a typical like, bomb. Like a, trip, like a typical bomb, yeah, yeah. That, that you would expect to see. Probably more like about a 400-gallon propane tank with fins on it <laughs> would be the way to describe it. Yeah, that, yeah. Would, yeah, that would kind of, plus a tail section. Plus a tail section, yeah. And so, it, along with all the sensors and everything else to make sure it goes off at the right height. And uh, then you've got... You've got Fat Man, remember. Fat Man, which is the round work, one. You're working with a sphere that uh -huh. you've got to collapse. Right. And it's big. It's probably six feet, seven feet in diameter. And again, it has all of the altitude sensors just like uh, Everything, just like that one. Wow. Okay. This is cool. I'm, I, I'm, I'm learning a lot about nuclear. About uh, yeah, nuclear. Yeah. Okay. Now we've got a 1942 custom limousine. Packard. It's a Packard Clipper. Now, it it's one of the original limos that they make. You notice they cut it in half. Right. And they needed a way to transport the scientists because you know cars were kind of in short supply at that point. So you obviously have your front end here right and you have your back end here right but it's wartime and you aren't getting any metal okay so you have ash framing and plywood oh really that's plywood. so the center two doors are yeah this, are is, a four, this is a four-door limousine uh on a packard clipper but uh they've extended it and the middle is wood <laughs> <laughs> hence the canvas top Okay, yep, that, that goes in between the two. And the 25 mile an hour speed limit. You didn't want it falling apart halfway there. <laughs> okay, the, the, now they just welded more into the frame or the frame? No, wood it's, also. the frame is wood also. They really? couldn't get any metal. Dang. And yeah. it's painted kind of a military green color. Yeah. And... yeah. Now, think about this Los Alamos is an hour 45 to two hours north of us at 75 miles an hour. Right. Trinity's about two and a half hours south of us at 75 miles an hour. Right. You're going from Los Alamos to Trinity at 25 miles an hour in this vehicle. Need that's I taking, say more? That's taking you two days to get it done. Yeah. Now, if you look up, there's a picture up here of the Trinity base camp. Okay. And it has a flagpole on it. Uh-huh. And if you'll turn behind you, you'll see what's left of the flag. Oh, wow. A little that, bit of wind, huh? That is just pure old New Mexico wind. <laughs> no, no blast or any, just New Mexico. Just, wow. And then if you look to the 
left, just to the left of the flagpole, you'll see one of these limousines. I see it sitting right there. Yep. It's this one. How many did they make? I'm not sure. Okay. But it is this one by serial number. Okay, cool. And then you've got another one over here. This one's a... This one is an absolutely period correct, model correct and everything of the vehicle they used to transport the pit for the Trinity test from Los Alamos to Trinity. Okay. And it was a driver and a guard. Of course, nobody knew what they had, so why would you need more than a single guard? But okay. uh, take a look in the back seat and see the high-tech device that they used for transporting the ball pit. Really? <laughs> a wooden we, we, we've got a wooden box on a, on a little frame. I guess it's more of a carrying frame with a lid on top of it and a couple of little peepholes in the side. That's their, that's their high-tech carrying device. Yes. Is it cushioned inside at all? I don't know. I don't think so. I'll bet this guy was a little bit nervous driving. I don't think he had any clues what he had. <laughs> no, uh, only the scientists knew what they had. Okay. The rest of the people knew this is my job. I don't know what the hell it's for, but this is my job. Huh. <laughs> It looks like a box you'd carry some uh, small critters in. Or yeah, something. a rabbit or something. <laughs> he was probably wondering what he was carrying a rabbit that far for. <laughs> now, oh. there, the, the decision to drop is one of the things that subsequently to the time period has become somewhat controversial. Right. The, the bottom line answer is that unless you take a look at the history, and go back and see the attitudes and the feelings of the people and what had gone on at that time, you cannot really make a decent decision. And that's true with any point in history. That is exactly true. So what you've got is the Japanese had absolutely ravaged China. Right. War crime after war crime after war crime. They brutally beaten and murdered U.S. prisoners. Uh, there was a great deal of hatred back then. Oh, I was going to say the Japanese were really kind of a brutal people yeah, the, as far as the treatment of war uh, yeah, they, opposition. They, yeah, as far as they were concerned, if you surrendered, you were dirt. Right. And in many cases, their people didn't surrender until the last instant. And then a lot of them, not until the emperor told them to. So you have this, some people today say, oh, well, we should have given them a demonstration, this, that, and the other thing. But even when they finally surrendered, there were officers, major level, field grade officer level, that attempted a coup against the emperor to keep fighting. That doesn't surprise me. Yeah. They now, pulled the last, they la pulled the last uh, still fighting Japanese uh, warrior, or whatever you want to call him, off of the island of Guam, I think, in 1970. 70, <laughs> 76. I got 76. there in 77. I okay. flew out of there in 77. Yeah, so he was still fighting the war. <laughs> yeah, I was I was there in 70 uh, during flying B-52 Arclight missions, and he was there. But <laughs> <laughs> the thing about it was that the Japanese military had taken the, the approach that we're going to put women and children on the beach, we're going to give them sharpened stakes, pitchforks, whatever else we can find. And we expect them to upset the first wave of troops. So if you think about it, if you do something like that and you, and you put these untrained, well, they had some training, but really ineffective people out there, had, they, had we had to invade Japan, we probably would have had to annihilate the entire Japanese race. That's probably a true statement. I mean, a lot of the w battles on these islands and stuff, they, yeah, they took it, them down to where there wasn't anything green on them, from what I understand. Yeah, and they, and had they to, still had massive losses because of the tunnels and, and other things. They had to totally annihilate everybody that was there. And in fact, on Okinawa, even some of the civilians were so brainwashed that they jumped off cliffs committing suicide rather than, right. rather than be captured. So... I had been volunteering at the National Air and Space Museum in Chantilly, Virginia, where Enola Gay is. Okay. And one of the posts we had was out in front of Enola Gay where you could talk to people and everything. And I had a Japanese gentleman come by and point to the airplane and say, I'm alive because of that airplane. Really? And, and that's the truth of the matter. 
the Japanese population probably would have been almost annihilated. That's that's an interesting. So that's a, that's the perspective. We, right. And we now have film documentation and everything from the Japan War Ar archives that do show them training the women with sharp pay and the children to uh -huh. stand at the beach. Well, you know dang well the, the GIs are not going to stand there and get scared. Oh, right, right. Well, and the, and they employed the the children a lot in their in their efforts. I mean, we had a bunch of balloons that they floated across that were all made in school by yeah. the Japanese children that were set to, uh, from what I understand, cause forest fires and yes. that kind of stuff in this country. To that that was their way. Yeah, they, they were thought that they were going to take us over. Yeah, they were aware of the jet stream. We were not right and, until the B twenty nine started flying out of Guam. And when they tried high altitude bombing, that's when they found out that the jet stream was there and that the high altitude bombing was a total loss. Wow. Okay. So but the Japanese had that jet stream thing pretty well mastered to be able to take a balloon and set it off. Well, they, and, they, and they get knew it all the way they over knew here. they knew about the prevailing westerlies and all that. Right. So, okay. What, you, what you're hearing right now is just a, a film talking about the Cold War, and I think we can kind of go beyond that if you'd like. Excuse us. Excuse me. And now we come down here to the Berlin, Air, Berlin Airlift. Okay. Now that occurred in 1948, and what happened was that Russia, Stalin, cut off all the ground routes to Berlin in an attempt to drive the Allies out. So what happened was that the three air corridors were open and there were three air corridors that went into three different airfields and early on it was kind of a hit and miss operation but then they brought in a logistics wizard and he set it up so that the aircraft would take off out of Frankfurt okay or maybe one of the other fields around would enter the stream and would go in and make an approach at one of the airfields. If he landed, great, they'd unload him and he would swing back into the stream and go back. If he had a missed approach, he would go all the way back to Frankfurt and start over. So oh, that wow. they so they didn't disrupt the stream. Uh-huh. And what it amounted to, by the end of the Berlin airlift, Berlin needed ten thousand tons a day to be comfortable. Okay. The Allies were delivering 12,000 tons a day. Okay. So Solid could see that not only were they getting what they needed, they were getting backlog build up. He had no choice, so he was humiliated in the Berlin airlift. It's kind of interesting how we how we go from lend lease and giving all kinds of aid to Russia during World War II to where Russia becomes our, our arch enemy. And, and the whole Cold War thing goes on. Yeah. Now, here in the 50s, for those of us that were around in the 50s, um, this is the type of fallout shelter they tried to get people to build in the suburbs, underground. They, in the cities, there were areas underground in the city, cellar, basement, parking. I was going to say, almost every courthouse and, and yeah. government building and stuff had a uh, fallout uh, shelter. Uh, shelter sign that was yellow with a nuclear, yeah, with three triangles in it. Yeah. And you knew that there was supposedly rations and everything there. Yeah, and they were trying to encourage people in the suburb to build these. Now, the 50s, the the... The late 40s were kind of fall back, regroup, and figure out what we really had done. Right. And then in the 50s, we began, okay, now where do we go from here? So there were a number of things that made good sense. And then there are a few things here that I'll show you that make you scratch your head and say, what the hell were they thinking? <laughs> So did a lot of people build these fallout shelters? Uh, and not as many, and nearly as many as they wanted, but yeah, some did. Okay, uh, over here, take a quick look. We're looking at a 16-inch shell for an, uh, an Iowa-class battleship. There were four of them, Iowa, New Jersey, Missouri, and Wisconsin. And these had nuclear warheads on them? That is a nuclear warhead. That's a nuclear warhead. Okay, and I'm looking at a, at a warhead point that is 
about five and a half feet tall, probably 14 inches round, and it looks like it's actually, it looks like a bullet tip. It's actually 16 inches round. For 16 a, inches round. For a 16 inch rifle. I have to just take a guess. But yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I try. Now, you saw how big Fat Man was, right. how big the gadget is. That's the warhead for a Lance, which is a second generation army missile, ground launch missile that was in Germany. Okay. That's, so you, it's smaller. Oh, it's way smaller. Yeah, because yeah. uh, uh, the nuclear part of this is only three and a half feet by, what, 14 inches? Yeah. Because it and, fits inside the 16-inch casing. Yeah, and, and that's it. That's, okay. And now, then does it have a charge on the top? Uh, everything's self-contained. Everything's self-contained. And it's, does it still have all the barometer stuff to know exactly when to go No, off they're or? much better. They're okay. They're much better. There are a number of things that I'm not at liberty to discuss that play into it. Okay. Now, I said there were some things that make you scratch your head and wonder what the hell they were thinking. Right. Do you know what a rifle grenade is? Right. Yeah, it's, it's a hand grenade, grenade with a tube they put over the oh, rifle. rifle. Yeah. Shoot, and it lobs. How about a nuclear rifle grenade? No. Yes. <laughs> the, F, the 106 millimeter recoilless rifle was an anti-tank weapon that was jeep mounted and it was recoilless because it, the back blast was actually vented rather and shell went forward back. Kind of shot like a bazooka. Yeah, exactly. Okay. And so they developed what they called Davy Crockett, which was designed to go over the barrel of a 106 recoilless rifle. Had a, had a range of about 6,000 yards. I don't know what the burst radius on it was, but I had a friend that was trained on it, and his comment was, we were told to take appropriate cover. Yeah, like run as fast as you can, because 6,000 yards isn't all that far to get away from the fallout. <laughs> <laughs> and this little thing's probably, what, uh, 24 inches long? At the most. Eight. And probably 10 inches round. And yes. looks, looks like a blimp with, with uh, fins. tails on it, fins on it. And it went on the end of a, on the end of a jeep mounted gun. <laughs> now, wow. now this is another one of those. This makes a lot more sense. In um, the fifties and sixties, the Russians or the Soviets had about a twelve to one tank advantage on us. Okay. And so what they were worried about was the tanks coming through the fold of gap and just totally overwhelming. Okay. So the way they were going to stop that was, they built these. They called them the sewer, uh, had the nickname the sewer pipe, but it's the tactical uh, atomic demolition munition. The idea was you'd slide that under a bridge culvert, you'd put it under a bridge, you'd put it anywhere, and you'd detonate it. You'd clear the bridge, you'd clear the culvert, whatever. And in the process, you'd make radioactive tank traps. Okay. So that, that one made a bit of sense, especially considering it. And this one here looks like a 16 or 18 inch culvert that you'd see underneath a, a, a roadway. A road. And it's about six foot long. Yeah. And they just set those up underneath bridges and stuff. Yes. Yeah. That's, that's pretty cool. No, it's not cool. It's probably <laughs> pretty hot. Yeah. <laughs> now, here's another one of those scratch your head weapons. Okay. This is a special atomic demolition munition. Or the man portable, man portable nuclear bomb. Uh, yeah. Uh, it had a case. It was designed for two special forces people. It had a rope. That was so you could bail out of the airplane with it and have it a hit below you. Okay. And this is actually the bomb. Okay. And you have basically a cylinder that's about 12 inches in diameter and another one that's maybe 13 inches in diameter kind of stacked up. And up on top is a timer. Okay. So basically you set the timer and run like hell. Yeah. So you paratroop out, you have this thing below you, and then you land, take off your chute, set your timer and run. Well, not necessarily right where you land. Oh. Okay. Yeah, because it's got handles on it. It, it looks like a, like a round uh, case, maybe like, what, a, a couple of hat cases or something yeah. that have handles on it that are made out of canvas and a, and a bunch of straps, and you, so two guys could carry it. How much does this thing weigh? I think it's around 
Well, there it is. It says uh, 58, 58 pounds. So two 58 guys, point. two guys with it'd be like carrying a five gallon pail or something. Yeah. And uh, now, where did this idea come from? Well, let's think back to World War II. The Germans were after heavy water. Okay. And there was only one place in the world to get heavy water at that time, and that was the Norse hydro plant in Norway. Okay. The British sent in Lancasters after it, and they didn't get it. They sent in a Norwegian team, and they didn't get it. So then they sent in a second Norwegian team, and they did get it. Okay. So what they're thinking is, if we've got to blow a Norse hydro, all you got to do is get one guy in there. Okay. And you can blow the entire plant. They had to put in a team of demolition experts that would set everything. They finally got it. Side story on that is, once they got it, they, they couldn't be repaired. They got it so it couldn't be repaired. Uh, the German, there was about 1,200 tons of heavy water. So the Germans loaded that into tank cars and loaded them on a barge to take them across to join the German railway system. Norwegian Underground took care of it. In the middle, deepest part of the lake, they blew the barge up and it sank. Oh, wow. Okay, now what exactly is heavy water? Is that, that that's water that's, that's got uranium going through it? No. Heavy water, a lot of people have that misconception. Heavy water is actually the same old water you see everywhere. The difference is the, the water that everybody's familiar with has one proton okay. and one electron in the atom. Okay. Heavy water has one proton, one neutron in the nucleus, and one electron. And is it occurring naturally? Yes. Okay. Wow. And then you have, you actually have a third type of hydrogen called tritium, where you have one proton, two neutrons. Okay. Now that's radioactive. Okay. Huh. All of this chemistry. <laughs> Chemistry, <laughs> physics, it all blends you know, together. And I, it's not my strong suit. <laughs> okay, we're looking here at the Honest John. It basically looks like a, a long stovepipe with a bubble head on it, and it's the first generation ground-launched Army rocket. And it's a rocket. It had no guidance. Okay. Lance was a missile. It had guidance. This is, you shoot it, and wherever it's aimed, that's where it's going. Okay. And it's and, and you've got elevators to make yeah, it, you've, to, you've, to set your trajectory to some degree. Yeah. You, and what was the range on this? Um, range is about fifteen miles. Oh wow! And it was all set up with nuclear head also. Yeah. Uh, now, did they ever launch many of these? I mean, you hear about Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Were there ever any other? There were tests. There were tests, but they didn't have actual. There, no, there's never been another bomb used in war. Okay. But we did have tests, several hundred tests. Okay, and those tests were conducted? Uh, Bikini, uh, Nevada, the National Test Site in Nevada, things like that. Okay. Yeah. Now over here, you have two reentry vehicles. Okay. One has been fired and tested, the Mark V reentry vehicle. Fired and tested, but it didn't go off. No, it's, it wasn't designed to go off. It okay. was, it, the missile was fired. It went exo-atmospheric. It was designed to test the re-entry trajectory and everything of the missile. Okay. Of the warhead. So that one's been used, and that's what it looks like before it was used. Okay. So you have a, a pure white... Outer casing. Outer casing, and then the, in, on the used vehicle... There is a big gap in the uh, blade of material. Right. And those kind of gaps cause inaccuracies. So the later blade of material, that doesn't happen. Okay. Wow. And, yeah, and these ones here are, what, two and a half foot at the base and taper on up like, a, like what you'd think of a rocket nose yeah. cone. And it sits probably six and a half feet tall. Yeah. Something to that. Yeah, but... And uh, weighs about 800 pounds. Yeah, yeah. I would have thought that it weighed a lot more than that. No. The, uh, as we go around, you'll see how the wet warheads have shrunk. Okay. Now, this is kind of an interesting device. <clears throat> this particular weapon is one of the very, very earlier nuclear weapons 
that was not Fat Man or Little Boy. Okay. I think this is the Mark IV, if I remember Mark correctly. Mark V, uh, MK5. I Mark V. Is. Okay. So the way this thing worked, if a crew was scheduled to fly with a weapon, they would go to the Atomic Energy Commission and check out this bird cage. And now what you have is a cage around a cylinder. Right. The cylinder's probably six to eight inches in diameter and probably two feet long. Right. That is the pit. For okay. The, so what they would do is they would check this out, they'd put it in a pressurized compartment, they'd take off, level off at 3,000 feet, and then whoever was designated would go back, take the cylinder out, carry it back to the bomb bay, open these two doors in the front of the bomb, put the cylinder in, close it, go back in, and they'd fly their mission. At 3,000 feet on the way home, they'd reverse the process. So then, when they were done, they'd go sign this back into the Atomic Energy Commission. Now, you have about an 18-inch square grid around that cylinder, and the reason for that is so that when they're in storage, they can't be put enough, close enough together to go critical. So, so the guy that, that walks along a plane that's flying and loads it into the front of this missile, does he get extra pay? That I don't know. Or does he just get an insane asylum uh, duty at the end of his tour? Hey, he, he, it was probably the bombardier, and he, was, he just had his regular flight pay. <laughs> we have some other weapons here. We do not, have, by any stretch, have all our weapons here. But we have one weapon that illustrates the penetration weapon, and it's just a massive chunk of steel. Uh-huh. As you can see. Right. Now, the one behind it is kind of a large bomb. Right. That was the first one they put under the wing of a fighter. Okay, so they were carrying these underneath, underneath the wings, F-84. too. F-84. Okay. F-84. And that one's probably, what, uh, 18, 20 foot long? Yeah, it's the one. And, and it looks like what you'd think of as a, it, as a bomb. Yeah, and it's so, bi the, so big, the tail fin had to be folded up so the aircraft could taxi. Oh, really? Yeah. Huh. This was the first generation of fighters on alert in Germany with nuclear weapons. And about what year was that? I would say early to mid-50s. Okay. Uh, that's an estimate. Right, right. Now, this little gem here is another one of those ones that says, what the hell were they thinking? But then when you start thinking about it, you can understand where it came from. Okay. So think back to World War II. Okay. You had hundreds of airplanes attacking a city. So how do you counter hundreds of airplanes, a big fleet? You have a very small air-launched nuclear rocket that you lob into the middle of their formation and detonate. Really? Yes. This is, that's the MB-1 Genie. And this was actually on alert in the 50s on F-89 Scorpion aircraft. Okay. Now, let's step back. You know, World War II, hundreds of airplanes. And then all of a sudden they started thinking, wait a minute. Now it's one airplane, four cities. Maybe this isn't such a good idea. Right. So yeah, but, it, when you, but when you've got a whole group of planes, that, that does make yeah. a certain amount of sense. Yeah, it makes sense. But the thing was, <clears throat> they retired it because they realized that they didn't have that anymore. Right, right. Now there was another weapon that's outside the uh, IM-99 Bomark, which was a long-range intercept missile. And it was rocket-launched, uh, ramjet-propelled. The A version went 250 miles, the B version went 460 miles, and they were nuclear-tipped also. Okay. And on top of that, then there's the Nike Hercules, which had the capability of a nuclear tip. Wow, there's a lot more nuclear stuff flying around than what I ever, ever even thought about. <clears throat> yeah. Okay, now, airborne alert. There were basically five orbits. And we have here in front of us a chart of what are called broken arrows. Now, these broken arrow, broken arrow is a code word for irreparable damage or destruction of a nuclear weapon. Okay. So 
when you have an incident like this, like the Palomares incident in Spain, or the Thule incident in Greenland, they were called broken arrows. Okay. So now the Palomares incident occurred in what in what was known as the uh, Mediterranean orbit. Okay. They were going squares around the Mediterranean. They were refueling over Spain, friendly territory. Tankers coming up out of Spain. That's why they were refueling there. So, uh, if you we'll go over there in just a minute. But the idea is when you're refueling a B-52 behind a tanker, you're about 17 feet behind them. That's all? Your nose is up underneath them. Okay. So the boom is behind the pilots, about the middle of the upper deck. And when you, hit, when the, when you make contact and they start pumping fuel, the electronic warfare officer has to get out of his seat, come forward, and check for no leaks. Okay. So it's behind the pilot. So you're up in under the tanker, and your boom length is about 17 feet when you're in the green. That's crazy, isn't it? It's routine. <laughs> You'd think that any uh, turbulence would take care of that 17-foot distance. <laughs> Yeah, I, 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 I've actually seen the, that happening uh, in the air, like over Wyoming. Uh, I, I've seen it a couple of different times where you can see the plane and the... Yeah, but you the, can see the nose is right up under the air. Yeah, it is. And to give you an idea, turbulence, I went out for my... Well, to qualify as a pilot, you have to go out, take off at max gross weight. All right. Go out at night... Hit her tanker, on loan a minimum of 70,000 pounds, and come within 5,000 pounds of maximum gross weight. Okay. So the night I practiced, uh, for my practice for that, I went out, hit the tanker, locked on. The entire way was in and out of clouds, in and out of turbulence, just stand there neat, go out on my check ride, clank, have to go back and redo it. <laughs> Yeah, I, that just is amazing. But so you can see how an accident might happen. Right, right. When the accident happened, both airplanes broke up. Okay. Now, the B 52s in this configuration were carrying four of these B 28 bombs. Okay. They two lower, two upper. And that filled the forward bomb bay. So when the accident happened, these weapons broke loose. So at any rate, he's got four of these. Right. And believe it or not, these are designed to be released from 500 feet. And in fact, we practiced that routinely. Okay. So when they broke up at high altitude, two of the weapons, these two, the parachutes opened on. And you see the crushed nose. Right. And the That's all designed into it. Okay. For when you drop it from 500 feet. So perfectly normal. The far one landed on the ground, picked it up right away. This one went into the ocean. Okay. The admiral in charge of the first group that was looking for it decided he was going to start at shore and work his way out. Six weeks later, a new group comes in, and this time the person in charge listens to the locals. Three locals saw it go in. One was a fisherman who was out in the water. Okay. And two on shore. And they had an individual that then triangulated those, and they picked it up in about a day and a half. Really? So bottom line to that was, you may want to listen to the locals. They might know something. Right. Ben, these are the two actual bombs. bombs. That, okay, and there's a lot more to the story as far as cleanup and, and some of oh, that yeah. kind of stuff. It, oh, yeah. Now, two of them, uh, the parachute didn't open on, and they functioned exactly as they were supposed to. The high-explosive... They knew the high explosive was going to go off if that happened. Right. But they had it built in such a way that there was no way it could go nuclear. Okay. So it's what they call low order or single point safe. Okay. And at that point, <clears throat> what you have is basically a dirty bomb. Okay. And that's what they had, and that's what they had to clean up. Yeah, and that was quite a cleanup from yeah. what I understand. Yeah. Now, if you look up directly above you, right, that is the second-generation air-launched missile from a B-52. 
Okay. First generation's outside, the AGM-28. This is a SRAM missile, short range attack missile. Had a range of 60 to 80 miles. And if you look at the picture there, you see a rotary launcher. You see three of them. There right. are actually eight of them on there. Okay. So they have eight of those. And then you can see the two lower weapons in the forward bay. Right. So that particular aircraft is configured with 12 weapons. Wow. And, and what kind of damage are you talking about with these warheads? We know Hiroshima and Nagasaki, uh, but something okay. like this that you're carrying 12 of them on a plane. Um, uh, I'm, there are only a certain number of warheads we're allowed to talk about. Okay. <laughs> uh, I can tell you that's a megaton class weapon. Okay. Megaton class. And I can tell you that Fat Man was 21 kilotons. So that would do more. Wow. That's orders of magnitude more. I'm not sure what the yield of this is. I never personally worked with it. I've had these on alert personally. I had to know what they were. Okay. Now, uh, so that's the short-range attack missile. Now, up top there, you see a huge ballistic missile. Uh-huh. That's a And we're talking huge. It's, it's 50 foot long. It is a sea launch ballistic missile launches from underwater. Off of a submarine. Off of a submarine. It is the previous generation's submarine launched missile. The current generation, the Trident D5, is bigger. Really? Both of them can carry up to eight warheads independently targetable. That's unbelievable. There's the, war there's the nose cone cover for it. <laughs> Thing's huge. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we're, we're talking... What seven foot in diameter, but but this thing's it's got to be forty foot long, doesn't it? Yeah. Now That's this it. is a model of the Ohio class submarine. This is our current ballistic missile submarine. It was designed with twenty four tubes, 24, really twenty four missiles. This was used in the Poseidon class submarines, the Franklin class, and they were designed with sixteen tubes. Okay, and you've got a model of the Ohio submarine here, and there's hatches in the top that open up for these missiles to come out of. Yeah, the missiles... Now, is this a nuclear submarine as far as the way yes, that it's powered? absolutely. Okay. So, these things would leave port, submerge, nobody would see them for 90 days until they surfaced going into port. Really? And what depth would they kind of hang out at? Just wherever they wanted to be. Well, I'm quite sure they had patrol areas and everything, but obviously they're not going to give any information on that. Okay. I have absolutely no idea. Okay. I have a concept of what they might be able to do, but I have no idea. I just was kind of curious if they hung out at, at like 100 feet or, or 1,000 feet. Yeah. So those guys, they went underwater for 90 days straight. Yeah. Wow. And so... <clears throat> The, when the missile is fired, it comes up in a big bubble of steam. Uh huh. When it breaks the surface, the rocket engine ignites and off it goes. Okay. So it's kind of a two-stage deal. Mm hmm Actually, it's, it, you got two rocket stages. Okay. So you have the ejection stage and then you have the normal missile staging. Wow. That is just... And, okay. and how exactly does... Uh, does the propulsion system and stuff work like on these nuclear subs? They've got nuclear ships too, right? That uh, the, can go out for the, the, the 90 air, days or... The aircraft carriers, the ballistic missile submarines, and the fast attack submarines are nuclear. Okay. The rest of them are not. Okay. They're still running diesel? Yeah. Okay. Uh, some are running diesel boilers, some are running uh, diesel turbine. But they, these run a nuclear reactor, just like a station, nuclear reactor stateside, and they're making electricity. Okay. And oh, by the way, since we're making electricity, we can make oxygen. We can purify water. Okay. We got heat, we can purify water. And we got a carbon dioxide scrubber, so we're good to go. That's just amazing that something can stay underwater for 90 days. Yeah, and the, what, what they call the fast attack submarines are the ones that are, you know, go out and attack other things. And they jokingly call those big black and never come back. <laughs> okay. 
Now, uh, I'm going to get into some detail here and shut me off if it's, if it's not something you want to hear. But you see two weapons here. Okay. One is about a 15-foot, looks right. like a silver bullet. Yes. And that's actually what we nicknamed it as a crew. Okay. B-52 would carry four of those, and I've been on alert with them. But it is the current tactical weapon. So it's been around since 68. Wow. Now the, I and they're had, still using it. I had Mod Zero. This is Mod. Uh, th that's a Mod Zero. Okay. Which I had. We're now to Mod 12. Okay. Now the B83 replaced the B28. It's okay. a megaton class weapon. This is kiloton class. Okay. And um, these are the only two gravity weapons in the inventory. Okay, gravity means they're not self-propelled. They're dropped. They're just dropped. And the only airplane that can well, the only airplanes that can successfully drop them are the B-2, the stealth fighters. The F-16 can drop them because it can come in low, and but the B-52, the B-1, no way to survive the. Okay. <clears throat> now, in the in our military, we have two policies. One is called the two-man policy. Anytime anybody is around a nuclear weapon or a nuclear armed vehicle, you have to have two people equally qualified to the job to be done to be present. Okay. And they use a challenge and response checklist. If you have to gain access to an aircraft compartment that has mission material on board, not only do you have to have the two people, but you have to have the two officers. Okay. So if our my B-52 needed work, one of the five primary crew, two of the five primary crew members had to go sit in the cockpit. Either that or we had to uncock it and pull the box off. Really? Yeah. Wow. Now, in keeping with that two-man policy, when these weapons are sit in the weapons bay, uh -huh. They're blivets. They know nothing. Right. They're absolutely dumb. So now, to make them usable, and you can see here a bunch of different electronic boxes. They right. Get, they morph. You can tell is it, you know, age difference and everything. But basically, you have two custodians. Okay. Uh, well, two A custodians, two B custodians. The A custodians would come in and they'd put a code into the machine. Okay. The machine would then translate that code to what's to go into the weapon. Okay. So the A custodians have a code, but it's not what the weapon wants to hear, so there's no way they can mess with it. Okay. The B custodians come in, and they put their code in, and again, the machine translates it to what the weapon's looking for. Now the weapon can be loaded. So it takes two guys to load the weapon. It takes two guys to prepare the weapon for load. Oh, okay. So now you're going to have a weapons load team come out and load the weapon. Okay. So once the weapon's on the airplane, and I'm talking about a B-52 now, and when I flew them, it was a six-man crew. It's now a five-man crew, but it was a six-man crew. Um, <clears throat> the weapon would be loaded on the aircraft. And the, we would do a pre-flight every time we went on alert and look at the weapons and everything. And... When you went in, you had your interior pre-flight. You had a box, of, a number of switches, boxes, handles that had to be safety wire and sealed. So now let's say you get a, a code that says, go drop your weapon. Well, first off, before you can do anything, you have to, trans you have to decode the message. And pretty much, even though it says two primary crew members, everybody on the crew has to agree that, ooh, that's what it means. Okay. So now, how do we get the weapon off? Well, the first step is the electronic warfare officer has to break a safety wire and seal on, down by his foot and pull a handle. Okay. That handle is connected to a cable that is actually physically pulling a pin from the release mechanism. That pin's in, that bomb's going nowhere. Okay. Short of breakup of the aircraft. Right, right. So he pulls that pin. Now... The radar navigator <clears throat> has to break a safety wire and seal, open a box, connect the cannon plug. Now you can talk to the weapon because you've been totally isolated from the weapon. Okay. From there, 
<clears throat> in the message that tells you to go, you've got to decode another alphanumeric sequence that's called a permissive access link. <laughs> so the bomb is inert until the navigator puts that in the bomb and says, oh, I've been authorized to go. Okay. So now the next step is behind the pilot, there's another box, safety wired and sealed, and they're called the pilot's readiness switches. So you put those up. At this point, the radar can now break a safety wire and seal on the safe arm switch and take it from safe to arm. Uh, that's not difficult at all. <laughs> <laughs> that's the type of safety we had built. I was going to say, that's pretty secure. And that's why we did it. Now, obviously, with the B-2 and with a single seat fighter, the operation is different. Right. But that type of stuff. Huh. That's amazing. That's, that's a lot of security. Yeah. And what you had was this, at SAC Cruise, we were incredibly well trained. Right. No, you'd have to be. Every time we went on alert, we got tested on what was called positive control. Every month on alert, we got tested on weapons and doctrine and what to do if and all that stuff. Wow. That's amazing. And that would include aircraft emergency procedures, aircraft procedure. Anything was fair game. Okay, as you, as you walk straight out, you see the sail with a 645 on it. Right, that's off the nuclear sub. That is off the SSBN Polk, okay. a Franklin-class submarine. Okay. So now as we go around the yard, over here, you see an F-16. Okay. That's an A model past its useful life, so we have it on display. And you'll notice under the wing there's a B-61. Okay. So there's one on the other side. So that's a nuclear-capable aircraft. If you come out a little further, you see a silver airplane. Right. That's a MiG-23. Okay, that's the MiG. That's okay. a MiG-23, and certain versions of that are nuclear capable. Okay, and that's a Russian plane. Yes. Yes. Now, you see the big plane up on the pedestal? Right, right. That's an F-105. Okay. Now, that was built as a purpose-built, low-level, supersonic nuclear bomber. Okay. In the late 50s, early 60s. And the way, and in 1960, after Francis Powers was shot down, they decided that they could no longer go in high altitude, they had to go in low altitude. Okay. And there was a time period between when they had developed the bombs to where we could release them at 500 feet and the time they were high altitude released that they had to come up with a new way to deliver them. And they came up with a low altitude bombing system. The F-105, for instance, would come in supersonic and at a specified point would pull up in a 4G pull-up. Somewhere along that pull-up, his computer would release the weapon forward. Okay. And he would continue over the top, roll over, and head back the other way. Okay. That was called the labs maneuver. Okay. Toss bombing. Huh. So then, if we step out just a little further... We see a Navy A-7. Now, that doesn't look exactly like the ones you, do, you normally see because that's a two-seat variant. Okay. But the A-7 was a Navy aircraft that was nuclear capable when US Air, the Air Force and the Navy both used it. Okay. Now, the propeller airplane is a B-29 silver plate. Okay. That's it's, the one you were talking about. It's is number 15. Okay. Now, if you look straight across, you'll see... A Nike Hercules missile. Okay. That over there, just to the left of it, is an SA-2 guide rail, Soviet missile. Okay. Now, if you look out there, you can see kind of a cannon. Right. That's atomic anti, the nuclear cannon. There were 20 of them made. We got one of them. Okay. The silver tank out there is a tank from a B-58. Okay. In front of you is a B-52. Now that's that, what you flew. That's what I flew. Okay. Now that's a special airplane. That was assigned to the Atomic Energy Commission. Okay. So it is the only airplane that has actually dropped live armed nuclear weapons. It has actually dropped them. In testing. Wow. Okay. Now, over there is a B-47. That's kind of the precursor to the B-52. Okay. And believe it or not, for about a year and a half, they did the labs maneuver. Okay. Really? Yes. That plane did? Yeah. It's, wow. a, it's a six-engine jet bomber. Now, off to the side there, the first missile you see is the Peacekeeper. That was our most modern missile 
10 warheads and the Soviets were petrified of it. It was the first thing to go in the START Treaty. Okay. Next to it is the Titan missile, Titan II. Okay, and we went through the Titan missile silo in uh, Tucson, south of Tucson. Okay, Titan II is the King Kong missile, 13,500 mile range, nine megaton warhead. Okay. <clears throat> um, it had one big problem. It was liquid fueled with unsymmetrical dimethyl hydrazine and fuming nitric oxide, both of which are toxic and explosive. <laughs> Great. Yeah. Beyond that, you'll see a, have a missile with a roundel on it. Uh-huh. That's actually the Thor missile, and we had an agreement with the British. We'd provide the missile and the parts, and they'd provide the basing in the crews okay. in England. The one standing up is the Minuteman 1 that I told you about. Okay. And then the one laying down is the Polaris A3, which is the missile that was prior to the Trident. Thank you, sir. To, to the Poseidon missiles. So that was the original air, uh, sub-launch cruise missile. Now, as we come in here, this is where we start seeing the culture. Okay. That's developing. You see things like fail-safe. Movies that uh, the Russians are coming, they don't have the thing, but that was atomic testing and the ants grew to giant sizes and everything. Right, right. So you have all these movies that came out. The Russians are coming, the Russians are coming, fail safe, the Bedford incident, follow me boys. Okay. Now we have, there, there is more to the culture than just the movies and everything. Paul Newman was a huge advocate of nuclear power. Okay. And this is his Formula One race car and you can see he was pump, pumping nuclear power. Right. And, but this was run with uh, gasoline. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah, they've talked about nuclear cars and stuff for a long time and, and how little it would take to make them run forever. And well, that, Kind of like the nuclear subs, I guess, that your car would run forever well, you, on fusion. You've, you've got a shielding problem, basically. You've got a what? Shielding problem. Oh, okay, right. Yeah. So that, that's part of it. For instance, plutonium is poisonous and radioactive. Right. And we've got, we've got a display over here of uh, the Boy Scouts, nuclear science merit badge, uh, atomic energy merit badge. And so I guess the Scouts were, were kind of into the nuclear thing for a while. Yeah. And then uh, you've got some other, uh, what are these, sports jerseys? Yeah, bowling teams. Bowling teams, skis that are called Atomics, uh, just some different uh, clothing and, and sports team memorabilia. And then as, as we move on out, Close Encounter with the Third Kind. Oh, is that what that is? I, I, it may be, or it may be Star Wars, I'm not I sure. I don't know, I'm not enough into the sci-fi no. stuff to... But, now, there was a nuclear surface ship that was tested. It was never meant to be profitable, and it never was. Okay. But it was a combined cargo and passenger ship. And so here are your menus and some of the things okay. from that. And that was called the Savannah? Yes, NS Savannah. Okay. Now, now here we, you got a little chemistry set that's it's, atomic <laughs> energy. Yeah, it had from uranium. From 1955. Ura and, uranium and all kinds of good stuff. Yeah, the things you could do, play with back when, uh, oh, back yeah. in the day. Back in the day, yeah. <laughs> and then here you have some of the quackery that begins to come out. Earlier, this is in the 30s, early 40s, when they had, even before that, when they started discovering your radium, and they would have radium-infused water that would cure your headache. Right, right. And all this stuff. But so. it didn't cure it by death, right? Yeah. <laughs> No, we won't go there. Spot remover, some uranium spot, or radium spot yeah. remover. You can uh, see all the... Embalming fluid. You can see all the quackery that was going on. Yeah, but it had to have been pretty detrimental to health as far as long term. Oh, yeah, yeah. And then you have a DeLorean in here. Yeah, that, that's just kind of cool because of the back flux capacitor. Back to the future. Yeah. yeah, back to the future, flux capacitor. But still, it's pretty cool to have a DeLorean. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, we also have displays of what they're doing with uranium. Uranium is not toxic, but toxic. 
the, if the dust gets in your lungs, as it decays, that can cause damage to the lungs. Right. So what these various schools are doing, the local schools, they're working on masking and protection so that the, the people don't inhale it. Okay. So this is some of the research work that's being done by the local universities. Okay, and you've got a hands-on area back here for the kids. Yeah. That's pretty cool. Yeah, we, Pinocchio is a machine that we have that illustrates what a chain reaction looks like. Okay. But they say it's out of order, which means the compressor's probably down. Okay, but it's got a bunch of ping pong balls in it that I guess... Yeah, uh, what happens is in a chain reaction, a uh, neutron hits a nucleus, two more neutrons come out, and they set off things. And that just kind of illustrates that every time a ping pong ball crosses a, a sensor, it fires. Okay. And then you have a big pendulum here. Well, actually, this is designed to show periods. Okay. The periods of a pendulum. And you can see it. Oh. You can see the different lengths of the period, and how it makes S curves and stuff. Right. That's cool. And then he's riding a bike to turn a drill or light a light. Okay, so it's got a little generator in it. Yeah, and we have some stuff on nanotechnology over here. Okay. And so lots of things for for kids to do. Yeah. Well, it's kind of intriguing for adults too. Oh yeah. <laughs> When we set those up, we play. That's good. <clears throat> what, this direction? Yeah. Okay. Now, some other things, a part of the culture, uh, stamps. Stamps. You, all over the world, stamps with nuclear themes on them. Really? This is kind of a neat display. You've got a computer screen that's showing lots of different uh, stamps, all with the little nuclear atom in the in yeah. them. Who would have thought that they have that many stamps? Well, you look at all the postcards and envelopes. Yeah, that's and, amazing. <clears throat> and then Post Office Box 1663 was the code for Los Alamos. Okay. And interesting story on that, Deborah McKibben was the individual that was charged from 1942 to 1962 controlling access to Los Alamos. Okay. You didn't, you, if you wanted to get to Los Alamos, you went through Deborah McKibben. <laughs> okay. And during the war, she put in a request for 100 Sears catalogs. And okay. Sears came back and said, why would a single post office box need 100 catalogs? She said it's wartime. Yeah. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Okay. Yeah. Now, this, this is an interesting device. This is how they transport low-level nuclear waste. That would mean like a contaminated lab coat. Okay. Something like that. They put them in these barrels. And they look like 55-gallon drums. They are basically metal 55-gallon drums. Then they put it in this thing. Okay. And this has been tested by Sandia. It's been dropped over 100 feet. It's been tried to explode. It's indestructible, basically. So you have how many 55-gallon drums inside of this? Um, I think we have a configuration on it over here. And then it's uh, a great big cylinder that's probably 10-foot round. Yeah, and three of them. And three of them fit on a semi-truck. And they're... Uh, probably 10 feet tall, 8 feet tall. Uh, they're, 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 they're up there. Yeah. And, uh, and then they put the 55-gallon drums inside, and then what, what is in the outer casing? It's material, protective material. Like lead? Or? No, no. It's, it's packaging that's been developed to prevent damage from explosions, fire, dropping, Trucks tipping over. Or anything yeah, like anything that. like that. Yeah. Okay. And then do they bury this whole. No, system? they buried the drums. They just bury the drums. Yeah. Okay. Wow. That's kind of a cool thing. Yeah. And in fact, you can see how they would. Oh, yeah. Pack the drums there. Okay. 
Yeah. And so they put clothing and all that kind of, that, the low level stuff like you yeah. were saying. Yeah, okay. Now let's talk about the accidents or incidents. Okay. Three Mile Island was actually the first one. And I am not actually sure of what happened inside. Okay. But the net result was the containment vessel worked perfectly. And the entire result of the accident was a small amount of radioactive gas being released. Okay. So, eventually, so essentially it was a non-event. Right. But they made it out to be a big one. Yeah. Okay. Because the anti-nuclear people. Right. Right. Okay. Now let's get to Fukushima. This uh, was something that cut people off guard, although it should not have. Okay. Basically what happened in Fukushima was the earthquake hit. Right. Created the tsunami. Right. The tsunami came into the plant and it shorted out the water pumps that provided the cooling for the reactor. Right. So once they shut down, the, the reactor overheated and melted down. Right. That created a problem. Now they've dealt with that. They have gravity feed. Oh, water. Water. Okay. So that doesn't happen. Now Chernobyl, that's a horse of a different color. That's arrogance, ignorance, stupidity, and delusions of adequacy. Okay. The basic reactor design to begin with had three major flaws. And the Russians had asked British scientists to come in and take a look at it, and they identified the three flaws. The number one flaw was insufficient shielding. Okay. Number two flaw was that it had the potential to cavitate. And what that means is that if the pile reached a certain temperature, the water would flash off as steam and you would have no cooling. Okay. And then the third major design error was on the control rods, which are designed to control the number of neutrons available to the reaction. They had graphite tips to lubricate the slides. Okay. Well, when you put them down, those graphite tips acted as moderators. So actually you created a spike of neutrons before you started to control them. Okay. So now, what went wrong? Well, Friday afternoon, a trained crew was supposed to make a test. Okay. Now, the interesting thing about that test they were doing, two years before, they had done the same test at a reactor near St. Petersburg. And all the Soviet reactors were approximately the same design. Right. New, you, basic, you would figure that. All, yeah. all the same design. So when they did it, they got the spike, but because they'd been trained, they were able to control it. Okay. So they didn't get the flash off, and they didn't get the meltdown. But because of Soviet secrecy, they never told anybody else about it. Wow. So when the guy did it at Chernobyl, uh, the afternoon crew, you know, life happens and they didn't get it done. So the evening boss came in and he decided he was going to show them how good he was. Untrained, unqualified, too stupid to do the test. But he went ahead and did it. And as they did the test, they spiked the neutrons, they cavitated, they melted down. So, wow. so the bottom line on nuclear energy is uh, Fukushima was one of those ones that was, oh, we got caught with our pants down. Right. We learned, we now know better. Three Mile Island was, well, we designed that right, everything worked perfectly. The Chernobyl points out exactly what it takes to run a nuclear power plant safely. Look at the Navy. From 1955 to the present day, they have been running nuclear reactors on submarines and aircraft carriers. Right. Not a single incident even. And the reason for that is they have good policies and procedures. Right. And they ruthlessly enforce those policies and procedures. Now, that's not to say policies and procedures can't change and grow as we learn. Right, right. Example, Fukushima. But if you are going to safely run a reactor, you have to have good policies and procedures, and you have to have the discipline to run it. And that's where the commercial world breaks down. There are too many idiots out there that think they know better. 
<laughs> well, and how many and how many nuclear plants are actually up and running still? They've they've kind of shut most of them down, haven't they? Uh, there are some shut down, but there's some new ones building. I was going to say, I think they're trying to build a new one in southwestern uh, Wyoming. Uh, yeah, now they're experimenting with what they call small modular reactors. Okay. And there was a thing about it in the paper today that I looked at, and they're bad mouthing it, but yeah, it's going through growing pains. It no way around it. It's going to happen. And I've kind of been hearing some things about uh, not uranium, but I think thorium. 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 That's what it is. Yes. Yes. Well, and that we will seems get to there. Be kind of promising. We will get there in a moment. Okay. Okay. This is this is one of the things that you you try to make people stop and think. <sighs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Energy options. What are our options? There are only two ways to make electricity. One is to turn a generator. Right. And the second is with a photovoltaic cell. Okay. So now how do we do it? Well, let's start with hydroelectric power. That's kind of your basics. Oh, that's free, clean power, all that. Think of how many millions of acres are flooded out when you build that dam. Right. And now you look at the Hoover Dam with Lake Mead running out of water so that they can't even run the hydroelectric plant. Right, right. So hydroelectric, nice, but certainly not the panacea, especially with climate change. Right, right. Now... But the th you know, the other side of that is, is when you create a dam, you create a lot of fish habitat, okay, and yeah. recreation, and, and some other yeah, things they're, with they're, it. There are pluses uh, and minuses to it. it. It definitely hurts like salmon runs and some of that type of stuff. It, it also hurts farmland <coughs> right. and things like that. So it's a, it's a good power generator, but it certainly is not foolproof. Right, right. So, okay, what is another way? Fossil fuels, coal, oil, natural gas. Yeah, that's kind of what we're using right now. But then that has the detriment of, especially with coal, pollution. Right. And you're getting carbon dioxide out of each one of these, which is a greenhouse gas. So they certainly have their problems. Nuclear energy. Well, uh, just back up for a second. The way you generate power with this is you, you run water over a turbine, right. which turns a generator. Right. With these, with fossil fuels, you create steam which runs a turbine, turns a generator. Right. Nuclear energy. Again, the, the pros are it's clean and everything, but then you've got your uh, spent fuel. How do right. you deal with that? And part of the problem with that is due to Carter saying we're not going to reprocess fuel. Europe reprocesses fuel, and they have a much, much smaller volume. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. I was not aware of that. So... Uh, you, waste storage, heat, and stuff. But basically, you're generating heat, you're making steam, you're turning a turbine. Okay. So now we come to solar. And again, solar is not constant, although there are ways to make it better. One of the, the one way that it makes power is with the photovoltaic. Right. So that's a direct conversion of solar cells that people are used to seeing. But there is actually another way to use solar and you get a much longer lasting electrical power grid. And the way that works is, they, then they've got several, a couple of these in the desert where you have a whole circle of mirrors that are focused on a tower about 1500 feet up. Okay. That tower is what's called a heat sink. And they'll heat that to 2500, 3000 degrees during the day. And so you run the water through there you can run it through at night because it's cool, right, right. cooling down, but so you can make your steam and run it that way. So that's the two ways to make it with solar. Wind is actually with the propellers, you're direct driving your generators. Right, right. So you either turn something or you focus on on it. One of the two. Right. And nuclear is not a uh, not a bad way, really. It's, no, but and we have here. Uh, starting with the earliest designs, Gen 1, Chicago Pile 1, all the way around to some of the new stuff. And they're talking about small modular reactors. And what you're looking at 
is basically a very simple system, very low maintenance, very low requirements, and it will run a small area. Okay. So, for instance, Albuquerque might have a few of these placed around, and Albuquerque has power. Right. Out on the Indian Reservation where you're isolated, you run a couple of these, people have power. And they're good for about 60 years. Really? And that's what they're developing right that's now? That's what they're working on. Now, they're, and some people are showing them buried, some people are showing them buildings like this, but there's still a lot of issues to be resolved with. That's, right. But that's a potential. Here's a model of the NS Savannah. And as you can see, it was built as a fairly sleek ship, not a, not a big bulk cargo carrier right. and stuff like that. And it was all nuclear powered. Yeah, you can see that. Yep, they've got it all set up here so, with the side cut out of the model so that you can see just how uh, everything was set up in there. That is cool. Now, you mentioned thorium. Yes. Voila, thorium. Oh, we got a whole display. Yes, this is sponsored by the Thorium Consortium. They send everything in and we put it together. Okay. And the thing about thorium is that it cannot melt down. Right. So that you, you keep putting the fuel in and it goes through. And it has less fuel, much shorter half-lives. But it doesn't have the military capabilities. Right. Right. So that's that's I think I think that what I have kind of heard is that because it didn't have the military capabilities, it wasn't developed. Uh, yeah, it, it, it the, the military was the reason that a lot of nuclear was developed to begin yeah. with, and, and thorium kind of got overlooked. Oak Ridge had a thorium reactor in 1960. Oh, did they? And and that that turned out to not be so successful, didn't it? Well, it I, as my understanding, it was okay, but they wanted the other stuff because. Uh, you know, that would take more development. Right. Yeah, thorium is from... I, I just got through watching a YouTube thing on, on thorium, and they were saying that it had some, uh, some, not failures, but there was some technicalities with making it react the way that they wanted it to. And, yeah, there's and a lot of technicalities some, on and it. And they're still developing some of those. And now this display is set up by a uranium mining company. Okay. And... As I, as I mentioned earlier, the uh, gaseous diffusion became the primary way of enriching after the war. Okay. Well, now centrifuges have become the primary way. But again, you're just employing that little wee tiny three atomic mass unit difference in weight. Okay. To, to get a physical separation, because that's the only way you can separate them. Okay. So... This is how they do it. They go to uranium hexafluoride, ionize it. And Actually, they don't even have to ionize it now. That was for the other. Um, and as I said before, U-235 is only 0.7% of natural uranium. Okay. That's not much. <laughs> Mainly because it's deteriorated. Okay, now we're, we have a detail on the German program here. And basically, Heisenberg was in charge of the major portion of it, but the army, in their jealousy, had to have a more portion of it. And he was using cubes like that. Okay. Of uranium. And and, we're looking at about a two-inch cube. Yeah. And that's actually one of his cubes. Oh, that's one, that's one of the actual cubes. Yes. And here is how he was trying to do it. He was suspending the cubes into heavy water and stuff. Okay. Now, the Canadians do use heavy water reactors. The U.S. reactors all use graphite. Okay. Now, let's take a quick bend this way, and we'll catch the last two areas. Nuclear medicine is a huge spinoff. Right. Of nuclear. Now, you have the tracers, you have the... You know, the, you have the ability to inject tracers. You have the ability to actually inject killers. For instance, iodine-123 they use for diagnosing a thyroid issue. Right. 
iodine-133 they put in, and it goes to the thyroid and kills it. Okay. So, <laughs> so you can see how learning to use isotopes, learning iodine goes to the thyroid. Other minerals go to other parts of the body. So that's how they can use it. Yet gamma camera imaging, x-ray, x-ray fluorescence, all big spin-offs. And then, of course, you get to quackery. Yeah. You've got a big machine here that uh, it, it, is all made out of oak and has a bunch of dials. and it's, it's all designed to shock somebody. Right. It's an impressive looking thing. And as is this. This is the same thing. I don't know if this is working. but Oh, yeah. You can see how it's sparking. Uh-huh. And th this, they thought, was neat stuff. Huh. Now, as we come on around... But like your MRIs and all that are, are based off of nuclear too, aren't they? Or MRI Cat scans. originally started off as nuclear magnetic resonance. Okay. But they decided that was not a good name. Okay. So they went to magnetic resonance imaging. Basically, you're using a magnet to cause resonance within the nucleus of the atom. Okay. X-ray machine, that's an X-ray tube. Really? 1923. Doesn't mm. look anything like the ones that I've seen lately. No. Nope. <laughs> and here's where we start to get into some more quackery with the radium glass, you know, the radium uh, infused water and all that stuff. Over here, Geiger counters. Oh, a whole thing of Geiger counters. Various Geiger counters. <clears throat> now, okay. we come, now we come up with the fun stuff. The clicking you here is a Geiger counter, and the next clicking you here comes from a gasoline mantle that they really? used. Like a Coleman lantern. lantern. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, the little sock that they light. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, the next thing you see is a salt shaker. It's orange. Fiesta wear. Fiesta wear. Oh, wow. That's really given off a lot. Of... The orange from the, in the glaze is coming from uranium. Really? Okay. Yeah. Yes. And what's doing it with the mantles? Uh, I think there's an americium or thorium in it. I'm not sure. Okay. I think it's thorium. And a Geiger counter just measures how much, uh, how much uh, radiation is being emitted. Yeah. And, and, what listen, you're getting, and listen to this Fiesta wear. That's amazing. You're, basically what you're getting is the radioactive decay of the uranium. Okay. And then here you see some of the games and then the... Um, radium girls where they would use very fine paint brushes tip them with on their lips you know wet lips and stuff and then put the little dots on the radium dials and it had some very bad results yeah Radi radius radium lipsticks yeah and perfumes and now would that glow or or what was the purpose for that I, I don't know, other than the fact that radium was a big plaything. Okay. And then you see some of the other things, like your fire detector has americium in it. Okay. And that's radioactive. You can see some more of the Fiesta wear over there. Some of these big jugs are what they used to put water in. And the area we're in right now is called Radiation 101. And what people need to realize is that there's radiation around you all the time, every day. Right, right. And the radon gas was a big thing for a while uh, but, with houses and stuff. Uh, probably the most damaging is the ultraviolet. Okay. Coming from the sun. <laughs> uh, and the higher you get in altitude, like we're about 5,000 feet, 6,000 right. feet here, it's much more intense than it is at sea level. Right, right. Less atmosphere to dispel it. Sunburns happen a lot quicker at this altitude. Oh, yes. <clears throat> you do yes. not go outside without uh, sunscreen. Right. Yes. So is this about the end of our... This is about the end of it. Okay. And, and I've been probably much longer than I should have been. You know, it's all been very, very interesting. Oh, one, one more thing here. Yes. When I was growing up, not very long, but when I was growing up, they would sell shoes to parents by having them look in there, x-ray the kids' feet, and see how much tow room and stuff they had. 
Really? You can look in and see. I, what... I can see that. Yeah. And so they, they, they'd stick their feet inside of this machine, and, and then you could look through the little screen and see how they fed inside the shoe. Yeah. I used it a couple of times before they were taken <laughs> away. I'm that old. <laughs> Buster Brown must have been proud. Yeah. <laughs> That's I heard cool. about that thing. Just imagine how many people got foot cancer. <laughs> <laughs> I, I only used it a couple of times, so. Wow. <clears throat> Okay, well, Sam, I really appreciate you taking us through. I'm happy to do it. And showing us what all you've got here. This museum is an amazing museum. And just going through it uh, and looking at the displays and stuff is fantastic. But having the background behind a lot of this and, and some of the personal stories has been even better. Now, the museum, does it have a website? Yes. Do you know what it is? I think it's... Um the initials.org, but I'm not sure. Okay. Well, uh, we'll end up putting that in uh, with the and show notes. I, I was going to say, if you just Google it, it'll come up. Right. Yeah. The Mu National Museum, museum of, of Nuclear of Science, Science and, and History. History. And this museum is fantastic. Uh, what, I like to... What you see in here are our classrooms. We have, oh. we have classes. We uh, have schools in here for field trips and everything and science classes a lot. We have homeschool kids come in. And then on days when schools are closed and parents are working, we have science camps. And then all summer we have science camps. Oh, cool. Okay. So people could take advantage of that too. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, I like to finish my podcast out by saying that the world is full of wonder. <laughs> and this nuclear wonder is just unbelievable. I mean, the technology that took into developing it and, and the way that they've used it and everything is, is absolutely fascinating. People need to get out and explore. That's the reason I don't want to put this on YouTube is because I want people to come see what we're doing and get an idea of what's here and then be curious enough to come see. It, and There is an amazing amount of history here. Oh, an amazing amount. And hopefully... Within the next six months to a year, we will have another building. Oh, really? Yeah, we've got a bunch of stuff stored on base. <laughs> oh, my God, more stuff to see. More stuff to see. That, that will be basically what we call our Museum Artifact Center. And it will be kind of not open to the public, but there will be guided tours of it at certain times so we'll for extra. We'll have to come back. For, I've been here twice before. I'm going to come back again. For so extra price. Those, those things that we didn't get to see today. Yeah, we've got at least another 50 weapons on base. Wow. And everybody have an absolutely wonder-filled day. All the road and go. Where am I to go? Meet Johnny. Where am I to go? For I'm a young and a sailor lad. And where am I to go? Thank you.